Welcome to lecture 17, environmentalists. That means we only have 18, 19, and 20 to go for this semester. So hang in there, we're almost done. The learning objectives for today are important because they link back to a few of our prior lectures and to several of our future lectures. For example, invasive species, endangered species, we'll be looking at something interesting in lecture 18 and then of course climate change for 19 and 20. So we're going to define what an extinction is and what it's not and we'll give you some background information on how mass extinctions have occurred in geologic past. We'll look at some case studies of already extinct species, what kind of led to their issues, and evaluate several different methods of preventing extinctions in our world. So taking a holistic view of extinction, what exactly does that mean? First, you have to define what the term extinction is. It refers to a species having no living representative capable of producing viable offspring or it's died out. So what does viable offspring refer to? Being able to reproduce itself again with children that can reproduce. So if you uh, do not have sexual fitness, you not necessarily, but meaning the organism in question, sexual fitness refers to the ability of an organism to have uh, the traits or the ability to pass through genes on. So this is such an important aspect of extinctions because lots of organisms have gone extinct because this one thing happened where they couldn't pass on their genes successfully. Where did the word extinction originate? Actually, it's derived from a word, a Latin term, from the 1400s that was used for describing quenching fires. Later on, it was tied to hereditary title within a metaphorical context and now is associated with the extinction or dying off of organisms. Looking at our poor little dinosaur over here, all my friends are dead. Well, some of you may know that not all the dinosaurs went extinct at the end of the Cretaceous period. Avian dinosaurs survived. In the past, extinction was considered more acceptable than the concept is today. Humans would like to be able to stop all extinctions. Mother Nature probably is not going to allow that to happen as much as we may try to intervene. Ethically, I think we have a, a reason and a right to try, but there's some things we just can't prevent. Many scientists have traditionally viewed extinction as merely natural selection and action. But is it? That's the question you need to ask yourself. Older sentiment justified extinction by saying that if a species could not quickly adapt to a changing environment, it deserved its die-off opportunity because the species was obviously unfit for a changing world. The more we know about previous geologic extinctions, the more we're realizing it's not about a fast adaption sometimes, it's just about an adaption period and being able to pass those genes on. DNA changed the whole world of understanding evolution and certainly extinction. What are some views of extinction? Here's Mr. Dodo Bird over here. All my friends are dead. Well, in his case, that's probably true. Once a species dies, it is suddenly replaced by a different species. Is that really what happens? Humans tend to be the primary replacement spe species that fills a vacant niche. That is certainly the, an area of investigation that has merit to look into. Since life is just a continuous process of extinction versus diversification, those best suited to diversify deserve to live on. It makes it sound like it's a you deserve it or you don't story. It's really a lot more complex than that. So let's look a little deeper. It seems as though humans are the only species that are constantly aware of mortality and realize that the carrying capacity of the planet determines life expectancy. So we think, right? Humans have recently begun to view space, debris and rocks, sudden climate change and volcanism as potential causes of their own possible sudden extinction. And I think the key word there is sudden because there have been several examples in geologic paths where sudden extinctions did occur in terms of geologic reference. Now, looking at other views of extinction, 
Most, not all, species live in a few million years and die with one or no related descendants. This has been a cause of about 95% of the life forms that have gone extinct throughout geologic past. Natural selection is a process by which DNA is passed on to offspring. Now, random mutations can occur. One thing to keep in mind is a mutation may not be positive. It may not be negative. It could be neutral. So you can't assume that all mutations are bad. You can't assume all mutations are superhero gifts. Nevertheless, some can have a detrimental impact on the ability of an organism to pass genes on and then those organisms successfully be able to breed. The less available genes to a species, the greater possibility of extinction. So that goes back to that gene pool. The less gene pool that you have, the greater possibility of extinction. So you're looking at this plant and it says, please stop buying my friends if you're just going to slowly kill them. So that you non-thumb, green thumb people, maybe you should think about for those poor plants. And the milk jug in the prior slide was like, oh, my friends are dying in two weeks. Well, is that an extinction? Not really, but it could certainly lead to one in the case of the plants if we're not taking care of them. So let's look at the types of extinctions. There's a background and then there's mass extinctions. There is a definite need to understand the difference, not just for good and gold oil information, FYI, but for your test as well. A background extinction occurs when one species becomes extinct, not when multiple ones do. This most likely happens when one species fills a selective niche that becomes filled by another species. So competition played the big role in this necessary, one can't outdo the other, so the other goes goodbye. The best preventative tool is genetic diversity and minimal competition for limited resources such as habitat and preservation. So how's this going to differ, a background uh, extinction versus a mass extinction? These occur when multiple species become extinct within a punctuated period of time. So it's definitive period of time, shortened period of time. It occurs when an entire food chain or food web dies within a finite amount of time. This is obviously going to wreak havoc on multiple populations. The best preventative tool is extraterrestrial colonization and having technology to divide vert space debris like comets or meteorites. So realistically, not probably going to happen in our day and time. It could, and we've even had some success in, in deflecting certain types of space debris from hitting Earth. But we certainly didn't have that capability back when the non-avian dinosaurs were facing a six-mile-wide meteorite that crashed into Chicxulub in Mexico or Yucatan Peninsula. The rate of both extinction types is inconsistent, so it is scientifically difficult to prove how many new and old species are emerging or dying on a regular basis. It is believed that 5% of extinctions occurred only as a mass extinction. That leaves the remaining 95% as probable cause for background extinctions. We know at least five mass extinctions have occurred geologically and they've been scientifically documented. This is a case in point in the right with the non-avian dinosaurs and their extinction at the end of the Cretaceous period. So this is how it happened. Here's that six mile wide meteor headed towards Earth and it's going to smash into the Yucatan Peninsula. So background extinctions occur generally as a result of density dependent factors. Mass extinctions are caused by density independent factors like massive volcanic eruptions, meteorite strikes, and abrupt climate changes. So background extinctions are kind of harder to identify obviously because they're more complex. So you should expect a mass extinction event to greatly change the rules of evolution and they do. So let's look at density dependence and versus density and dependence guaranteed test questions. A density dependence is a factor whose effect on a population changes as population density changes. So numbers of the population matter here. Rainfall, for example, is required for livestock to have water to drink. All right, so let's compare that to density and 
dependence, a factor that impacts populations but is not influenced by the changes in the actual number of density of population. And in other words, the numbers in the population aren't a factor here. So it will either rain or fill up the stock tank, or it won't. Raining or not is not going to be the determining factor of whether animals die, you would say, but they need to drink. Could there be another source to drink? So rainfall here uh, is an independent factor of the stock tank, do the stock tank's gonna exist or not, whether it's dry or full of water. When we think of mass extinction events, there are generally several that come to mind. Uh, one, two, three, four, five are the most recognized with the six in progress right now. There was one at the end of the Ordovician period, uh, that Ancillurian, so the Ordovician is at the beginning of the Paleozoic, and it occurred when we had a sea level drop and then rise with a major transgressive sequence. So up, we had up to 85% of species that went extinct and 45 to 60% of marine species were killed or genuses were killed. What was the hypothesis cause of this particular extinction? Fast plate movements, glaciating, uh, glaciation, which led to abrupt climate change and changes in sea levels. In the late Devonian, which was several periods after the Ordovician, in the middle of the Paleozoic era, this occurred about 365 million years ago. It, in, it wiped out between 70 and 80% of all living species on the planet. 30% of families vanished, including marine life more decimated than freshwater and land fauna. It is unknown if some kind of extraterrestrial event occurred or if we had a possible glaciation and lethal temperature declines or if the ox, uh, oceans went anoxic on us. So the late Devonian is kind of a question mark. There's a lots of theories and some that are more substantiated than others. The Permian and Triassic. The Permian's the end of the Paleozoic. The Triassic is the beginning of the Mesozoic, which is dinosaur time frame. It occurred 251 million years ago and was the absolute most catastrophic mass extinction event of all time. Most devastating, it eliminated 85 to 90% of all marine and land vertebrates, 95% of all marine species, and it totally wiped out the trilobites. That's a funeral moment if you know what a trilobite is. And wiped out a number of land terrestrial trees. Well, there's a possible explanation for an asteroid or a meteorite strike. Definitely volcanic eruptions have been proven to occur at this time. And definitely changes in the chemistry of ocean have been documented. So another one occurred at the late Triassic. You're like, wow, what a bummer if you were just recovering from the Permian Triassic and at the end of the Triassic at uh, 200 or 199 million years ago, we would have another wipeout. Certainly the case. More than three quarters of all species and one quarter of families disappear. End of mammal-like reptiles and eel-like conodonts, which are if you would need to take historical geology to know what a conodon is, but they're kind of important for their fossils anyway for identifying oil and gas deposits. And then mainly uh, dinosaurs that have evolved thus far. So suspected, uh, not known though, what caused the Triassic mass extinction, but likely a fallen sea level. Probably oxygen uh, in the ocean was a target and then major increase in rainfall and possible comet or asteroid impact. The one we know the most about is the Cretaceous mass extinction event, often referred to as the KT boundary, K for the abbreviation geologically for Cretaceous and T for tertiary. Now, long story made short, tertiary is no longer recognized by most geologists and by the people who make the geologic time scale. So it's actually referred to as the KPG boundary for Paleogene. This occurred 65 million years ago and it wiped out 47% of marine genuses and 80% of land vertebrates. It wiped out all of the non-avian dinosaurs, but the avian dinosaurs or birds remained. So turtles, lizards, birds, and mammals were the survivors of this mass extinction event. 
We have found some evidence to support this one. There was very accelerated volcanism around the planet, and then we know that a six-mile-wide meteor smashed into Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico. So did that cause the wipeout of the animals? Probably played a role. But in each of these cases, I think it's important to note there could be a combination involved and likely is. Some scholars believe that humans will cause the sixth mass extinction via a combination of nuclear slash biological war and or climate change. Scary thoughts to behold because you're living in that time right now. Scientific data suggests that humans are already contributing to background extinctions of certain animals. There are many different species who Extinctions were likely caused by human activities. A few of these species include the giant moa, the saber-toothed cat, the quagga, the thylacine, the dodo bird, and the woolly mammoth. So looking at the pig over here, oh, my friends are bacon. I'm horrified. Will we lead to pigs to extinction? The answer is I don't know. All animals, including humans, are at risk for extinction. Let's look at the giant moa, very interesting bird. The giant moa was a wingless bird that lived in New Zealand. So I've been there, I've seen some fossil remnants of these guys in museums there. And it lived until about 1250 current era. So a century after humans first arrived to New Zealand. It does have a few living descendants in New Zealand, and one is so cute, and uh, it is called a kiwi. So if a kiwi is a much smaller version of this bird. But this particular species was likely hunted to extinction by the earliest hunter-gatherers that came to New Zealand in search of food resources. The saber-toothed cat disappeared within a few centuries after humans arrived in North America sometime between 13,000 and 11,000 years ago. They weighed anywhere from 120, depending on their age, pounds, to 800 pounds. They were built for power, not speed. Certainly their body plan, the way their hind legs were made, they were attackers. They were uh, jump-on type animals, surprise animals when they attacked. They possess a specific feline lineage and are not classified as tigers. So please do not refer to them as saber-toothed tigers. They are actually more related to lions than they are tigers. They were felines, but appeared to look more like a bear than they did a large cat. And they could kill an animal as large as a juvenile mammoth or mastodon back during the last ice age, known as the Pleistocene. It's believed that they would have been made a kill successfully by inserting their long saber tooths into the neck or the throat of or the windpipe of their prey. And then they would usually uh, drag their prey to their dens and have them for dinner. So these were very powerful animals and hunting did play a role in their disappearance. What about the quagga? This is an interesting animal. This is an equine that had the appearance of both a zebra and a horse. Kind of neat, huh? Not to be confused with a zorse, a real thing, for real. The quagga was its own subspecies of a zebra that was hunted for meat, its unique hide, and to clear land for domestication of livestock on the African grasslands. A shame, huh? The last wild quagga was shot during the 1870s, and the last quagga died in the Amsterdam Zoo in 1883. And this is him right there. What's the thylacine? An interesting animal. The thylacine was also known as the Tasmanian tiger or the Tazi, and was closer to a canine species than a feline. It was the largest marsupial predator to ever live, but was hunted to extinction by sheep herders who were following the colonization of Tasmania in 1824. Why is the thylacine such a big deal? Well, there's some past stuff and some new stuff to talk about it. Officials placed a bounty of one pound on each thylacine hide and paid up to 2,184 bounties between 1888 and 1909, virtually making it impossible for the thylacine to survive. After a few decades, early ecologists began to notice problems with excessive primary consumer herds and lobbied for conserving the thylacine's habitat. So it would be similar to kind of like what we discussed with the gray wolf in Yellowstone. 
1936, the Tasmanian government passed a law to protect the thylacine and sanctioned a 647,000 hectare, actually, refuge for them. Unfortunately, that was the same year that the last thylacine was trapped in the wild and soared to the Hobart Zoo where it died in captivity. Really? I mean, you're like, seriously? So when a zookeeper forgot to lock it before inclement weather happened, the poor guy died. The silocene was declared extinct by international standards in 1986. Many advocates for restoring the gray wolf reference the treatment of thylacine as demonstrative proof of how a lack of predators can shatter an entire ecosystem. Today, many Tasmanians report seeing Tassies, but there has been no conclusive evidence to support that since 1936. Let's look at the dodo bird. Interesting animal. The dodo stood about three feet tall and weighed between 25 and 40 pounds. I really would have liked to see one of these guys. They were hunted uh, to extinction by humans, though dodo meat was not particularly tasty, or so I've been told. They were simply described as being rather dumb and easy to catch and eat, so they were low-hanging fruit, if you want to call that, for survival. Some traveling sailors would hunt up to 50 dodo birds a day and then dry the dodo meat before a long trip. It's in its natural habitat, the dodo had no natural enemies and laid its eggs freely and unprotected. The invasive domesticated livestock tended to break and eat the dodo eggs as they discovered them. So this would be an example of an animal not being able to pass on its traits for DNA because its children wouldn't be successful in passing those on because the eggs couldn't hatch. Looking at the woolly mammoth, the stomachs of frozen mammoths return findings of extinct plant and grass species. Mammoth fossils annually turn up throughout the melting ice around North America and Siberia and even in, in non-iced areas uh, for other types of mammoths like Columbian mammoths. It is illegal, interesting, to import and export elephant ivory but not mammoth ivory. Why? Because mammoth ivory represents an already extinct species. Mammoth ivory in Alaska goes for about $95 a pound. That may change in the future, so if you're interested in buying that ivory, you should do it now. The woolly mammoth is believed to have gone extinct because of climate change and excessive hunting by humans. The secluded population died around 1700 before current uh, era on Wrangell Island in the Arctic Ocean north of Siberia. And this is a frozen woolly mammoth other extinct Pleistocene mammals, at the same time as the woolly mammoth, woolly rhinoceroses, large horses, long horned bison, short faced bears, which is what you see in this picture, and bear sized beavers also uh, roam grasslands along with the saber toothed cats of Siberia and North America. It remains largely unknown as to why they all specifically died, but depleting grassland habitats and climate change is thought to be the primary culprit of their demise. So let's talk about preventing an extinction. From these species, we have learned that sometimes background extinctions can be prevented doing several things. One, preserving habitat. Two, understanding the functions and ecology and the benefits of predation. And three, appreciating a wide variety of biodiversity. So taking a look over here, the real reason the dinosaurs went extinct. <laughs> you can get a, a laugh out of that a far side image there and think about that for a second. Was it really? I mean, did dinosaurs smoke or were they inhaling volcanic fumes? What happened to them? So what happens when none of these processes succeed? Well, we'll have an extinction, but maybe there's an exception to the rule. Let's go back to the thylacine. In 2008, scientists inserted several pieces of tassie DNA into a mouse embryo and added fluorescent gene that turned the tassie DNA green as it grew. So we could actually see it in real time. The embryo was not supposed to mature, but it was merely an attempt to see if cloning thylacine was even remotely possible. It is likely that the thylacine will eventually be cloned with a Tasmanian devil acting as a surrogate mother. Wouldn't that be kind of neat if we could see that? The woolly mammoth has a similar type of story. During 2007, a Siberian reindeer herder happened upon the most complete woolly mammoth specimen ever discovered. 
It only miss it, was missing its toenails, part of an ear, and most of its hair. I'd say that's pretty darn complete. They call this the ice baby. This female woolly mammoth is 40,000 years old and had hair that was three feet long, which is very indicative of the woolly mammoth. There are about a dozen tissue samples from other mammoths, but nothing quite as extraordinary as the ice baby. A CAT scan revealed that the complete muscle system of the woolly mammoth, as well as the contents of the animal's last meal, were in the body. This included some extinct berries and grasses. Along with muscle tissues were the animal's sex cells, which have most have been considered salvageable. So you can see, can see where I'm going with this, probably. Studies determined that the Asian elephant is very similar to the woolly mammoth and could provide pieces of DNA, maybe the missing pieces, to act as a surrogate mother for a hybrid woolly mammoth. The animal would then live in a cold ecosystem like Pleistocene Park. Well, maybe, maybe not. I would say you need to think about the ethical issues of that and could we bring back the woolly mammoth or a hybrid version of it and it survive even though it was selected for extinction. So thinking about Jurassic Park, you guys may or may not have seen the original Jurassic Park, may have seen the more recent Jurassic World, but it's all about cloning or bringing back extinct species to life. Well, it's really happening with something called a Chickenosaurus. This is reverse evolution. So what does that mean? Scientists have begun to experiment with understanding genes and learning how developmental genes turn off and on with the hopes of being able to create ancient species from modern DNA. So this is kind of what's happened with the Chickenosaurus, and that is a look at it over there. Birds represent the descendants of ancient theropod dinosaurs, so they're referred to as avian dinosaurs, and they possess much of the DNA needed to recreate miniature dinosaurs. Wouldn't that be awesome? By turning genes on and off, chicken embryos have been able to grow dinosaur legs, elongated snouts, and even alligator-like teeth. So that's an interesting fact of how we could engineer some form of evolution. So looking at the chickenosaurus here, you see a chicken adult and you see a theropod over here and we're getting a chicken embryo with some of those same types of features. This is, could be possible and something to think about. So let's watch a video on the chickenosaurus. Right here, this is super important to see the shape of the foot because this is what a theropod foot would look like. Um, so this is kind of an interesting development as you see the chickenosaurus actually in an embryo. So as you're watching these images, hopefully you have uh, realized that this may be possible. Is it ethical to clone extinct species? That's something you're going to have to answer for yourself. I can't answer it for you. Is it ethical to create an all new species that mimics an extinct species? Again, that's something you need to come up with your, for yourself. And the scientific community curiosity in answering questions is always what scientists are trying to do. Should we take confidence in using a process that's yet to produce a healthy extinct species? And I would also ask the ethical question, if we bring an extinct species back, will we have the adequate habitat to support them? That's an ethical issue that's a hard call to make. Because I sure would like to see a woolly mammoth or a Columbian mammoth sometime alive, but I'm not so sure I want to see T-Rex alive or worse, Velociraptor chasing me down the street. 
So let's take a look at some science servings. When Lyuba, which is the official name of the ice baby, was discovered, its reindeer herding discoverers sacrificed a baby reindeer and poured a bottle of vodka on the ground because he believed that that mammoth carcass serves or served as an ill omen for early death, and that's one of their cultural beliefs. It is estimated that for every 1,000 species that ever lived on Earth, only one remains. During the Cambrian period, over 500 million years ago, it is estimated that four or five times more species lived on the planet today, and that's often referred to as the Cambrian Explosion. In 1951, the Explorers Club hosted an annual dinner where it served 250,000-year-old woolly mammoth meat as the main course dish. The event claimed that the meat had been retrieved from the Yukon Territory, and that was a once-in-a-lifetime event. The price of your plate would have been 500 bucks. A sample of the meat was kept by an absent patron and later analyzed by a team at Yale who determined that the meat was actually sea turtle meat. Regardless of how you cut it, that's sad, right? Because sea turtles are endangered and then trying to pass it off as an extinct mammoth. Wow, but people do some interesting stuff. Recent fossil records from China indicate a juvenile T-Rex once had feathers. Very interesting fossil record found in China area, so stay tuned for more on that. Many tertiary predators face problems with incest, especially when cap in captivity, because so few of them remain that they need to interbreed or to actually pass on and make babies. But as you can see, that DNA could end up being an issue down the line. Here's an example, Kenny the tiger. This is a real tiger uh, generated from incestuous relationships within a zoo. Gene pool was not broad enough to create the same type of tiger that the rest that you would like to see yielded uh, prevail. But nevertheless, this is Kenny the tiger. The depressing future in the next four to five billion years, the sun will begin fusing helium and we'll expand into a big red giant star. When this occurs, it'll completely destroy our planet. We have a lot more to be worried about before four to five billion years from now. Actually, more like the next one to two billion years we need to really be concerned about. Eventually, everything on the planet will either be consumed by the sun or burned away by intense heat of our evolving star. This action will cause the last great mass extinction, or will it? Will mass extinctions are caused by something else before then? Will it be caused by humans? Could it be caused by another asteroid impact or climate change? You really need to think about those things as we leave this lesson. So, if survival depends on predation, predation depends on food resources, where do we stand in this equation as humans? Hopefully you'll think about that as we go into lecture 18, which is such a fascinating thing. I'm not going to let you in on the secret. You just got to stay tuned for it. Extinction's not an easy discussion to have because it's uncomfortable. But remember, in order to prevent an extinction, a species has to have viable offspring that can produce more of the same species. Without it, it's a guarantee it will go extinct. I'll see you at the next lecture. Bye.